Today, ahead, though dimly yet, we see in vistas a copious, sane, gigantic offspring. For our new world, I consider far less important for what it has done or what it is than for results to come. Soul among the nationalities, these states have assumed the task to put in forms of lasting power and practicality the moral, political speculations of ages, long, long deferred, the democratic republican principle, and the theory of development and perfection by voluntary standards and self-reliance. The poet Walt Whitman wrote these words in 1871, two years before he moved to Camden, New Jersey. In Whitman's view, 19th century America had the potential of fulfilling the promise to create a society in which all men and women would have equal rights. There were those in New Jersey who sought to realize Whitman's vision in their own time. The United States celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence on July 4th, 1826, with full acceptance of a social atmosphere where nearly everyone knew his place. Another revolution was just off stage. Old notions of knowing one's place were about to be tested. The American Revolution kindled a new spirit of human freedom. But Jerseymen continued to shoulder the great moral and spiritual burden of slavery and racial inequality. Gradual abolition after 1804 left freedmen and their posterity politically disenfranchised and economically subservient. Concern grew after about 1810 that emancipation, though preferable to slavery, had produced a wretched mass of humanity having little hope for social progress. Some reasoned that the colonization of free blacks in Africa offered a moral and practical resolution of these problems. In 1816, the Reverend Robert Fenley, a Presbyterian minister from Baskin Ridge, published a pamphlet in which he argued that the voluntary removal of free blacks to Africa was desirable because they would never be accorded racial equality in the United States. To fulfill his vision of a Christian Africa pioneered by freedmen from the New World, Finley helped to form the American Colonization Society in Washington, D.C. Robert F. Stockton of Princeton, then a lieutenant in the United States Navy, was approached by the American Colonization Society to help obtain territory on the west coast of Africa for the purpose of establishing a colony. With the consent of the United States Secretary of the Navy, Lieutenant Stockton sailed for Africa in the fall of 1821 with an agent of the American Colonization Society on board. They stopped first at the British colony of Sierra Leone, where they were told that Cape Maserato, about 250 miles to the southeast, might be a suitable location. However, the native chieftain, known to Europeans as King Peter, was opposed to a colony that might threaten the still active slave trade. 
Lieutenant Stockton pursued King Peter into the interior and at gunpoint forced him to cede to the American Colonization Society the territory that became the Republic of Liberia. In the early 19th century, white abolitionists envisioned colonization as an embodiment of their Christian duty. But later they saw the movement's thinly veiled hostility to free black Americans. Although some free blacks in New Jersey favored voluntary immigration schemes, the great majority opposed the African Colonization Society. They saw the society's program as being potentially involuntary and perpetuating slavery. Slave owners might send their most troublesome slaves to Africa and keep those who were submissive. There were anti-slavery strongholds in Salem and Burlington counties where the Quaker influence was strong and in Belleville, where the well-known abolitionists Theodore Dwight Well and his wife, Angelina Grimke Weld, and her sister, Sarah Grimke, had settled in 1840. However, the abolitionist moral dilemma of slavery and dedication to racial equality earned limited support in New Jersey before the Civil War. Notwithstanding the gradual abolition of slavery, the political status of free blacks actually deteriorated in the early 19th century. In 1807, the legislature stripped the franchise from women and free black men, a right they had enjoyed since the Revolutionary Era. Quakers were important reform leaders in New Jersey in the 1840s and 1850s. They had extensive connections to national reform networks. Within the abolition movement and Quaker circles, Angelina and Sarah Grimke who grew up on a plantation in South Carolina and later became agents for the American Anti-Slavery Society, had been causing a stir since the late 1830s by speaking and writing about women's subordinate civil, social, and economic status. The notoriety gained by the Grimkes because of their radical stands on women's role in reform preceded them when they moved to Fort Lee shortly after Angelina's marriage to the well-known abolitionist leader, Theodore Weld, in 1838. The Welds moved to a 50-acre farm along the Passaic River in Belleville in 1840. There, Theodore opened a boarding school in their home. In 1854, Theodore Weld took a job as the director of the Eagleswood School at the Raritan Bay Union outside of Perth Amboy. It was a spin-off of the North American Phalanx in Monmouth County, a cooperative community based on the ideas of the French socialist Charles Foyer. Despite the residence of the Weld Grimkes, New Jersey was not particularly receptive to the abolitionist position. It was the last northern state to abolish slavery, a step taken in 1804 in the form of a gradual manumission act that protected slaveholders from immediate financial loss. While free blacks in New Jersey struggled for equality, hundreds of escaped slaves from Maryland, Delaware, and the more distant slave states sought their help in the Underground Railroad. Despite the assistance given by blacks and sympathetic whites, New Jersey was not a prime haven for escaped slaves. An act passed by the legislature in 1826 provided for the return to their owners of fugitive slaves in New Jersey. The deficiencies of the old state constitution adopted on July 2nd, 1776, were becoming apparent to many New Jerseyans. That hastily drawn document did not reflect either sound thought or solid government. On May 14, 1844, 60 delegates opened a constitutional convention at Trenton. More than six weeks of debate and compromise went by before the new Constitution was ready on June 28th. Under the new Constitution, any white male citizen over 21 could vote, provided he had lived in New Jersey for one year and had been a resident of any one county for five months. The new state Constitution of 1844 was a symbol of expanding democracy in New Jersey because voters no longer had to meet a property qualification. But the document was also the instrument of popular feelings against black residents because it restricted the franchise to white male citizens. 
In the 1840s, petitions for the reform of married women's property rights are evidence that women's rights were increasingly of public interest. Couverture, the legal principle under which married women were subsumed into their husband's civil identity, remained unmodified in New Jersey at the time. Women relinquished to their husbands basic rights to hold and manage personal property and real estate, to have title to their wages and the guardianship of their children when they married. In 1852, the legislature passed the first New Jersey Married Women's Property Act, a narrow and limited act similar to the New York Act of 1848. The New Jersey Act allowed that the real and personal property a woman held before marriage could not be subject to disposal by her husband or liable for his debts upon her marriage and would continue her sole and separate property. Gradually over the 19th century, the New Jersey legislature was prevailed upon to chip at the wall of couverture, increasing the economic independence of married women. Lucy Stone was a major figure in the growing women's rights movement in the 19th century. Her decision to move to New Jersey had a profound impact on the direction of women's rights activism in the state. A native of Massachusetts, Lucy Stone was a graduate of Oberlin College, who had made a name for herself as an articulate reform lecturer in the widespread anti-slavery and women's rights circuit. In 1855, Stone married Henry Blackwell, an ideologically sympathetic Cincinnati merchant. Stone's decision to keep her own name scandalized traditionalists. In the spring of 1857, Lucy Stone bought a cottage on Cone Street in Orange and moved there with her husband. Stone's presence in New Jersey was soon made known through her much publicized protest against taxation without representation. Refusing to pay taxes on her home, Stone wrote a letter to the local tax collector. Mr. Mandeville, tax collector, sir. Enclosed, I return my tax bill without paying it. My reason for not doing so is that women suffer taxation and yet have no representation, which is not only unjust to one half of the adult population, but is contrary to our theory of government. For years, some women have been paying their taxes under protest, but still taxes are imposed and representation is not granted. We know well what the immediate result of this refusal must be. But we believe that when the attention of men is called to the wide difference between their theory of government and its practices in this particular, they cannot fail to see the mistake they now make by imposing taxes on women while they refuse to grant them the right of suffrage and that the sense of justice, which is in all good men, will lead them to correct it. Then shall we cheerfully pay our taxes. Not till then. Respectfully, Lucy Stone. To cover her taxes, the town posted a notice on the local station of the Erie and Western Railroad that some of Stone's effects, including her baby's cradle, would be sold at auction. Stone actually lost neither friends nor property by her actions. The furnishings were purchased by a neighbor and returned to her. Lucy Stone's protest of the local taxation of women without representation was widely publicized in reform circles. The knowledge that within living memory women had voted in New Jersey and the belief that this right had been taken away unconstitutionally was public enough to inspire further protest. As the fateful presidential election of 1860 approached, the sectional divisions over the slavery question were fast becoming a national crisis.
New Jersey was the only northern state to vote against Abraham Lincoln in the presidential elections of 1860 and 1864. In keeping with his pragmatic approach, Lincoln countermanded attempts by Union generals to recruit free blacks as soldiers. He postponed their induction into the military until a propitious turn in the struggle. Lincoln also was slow to make emancipation an issue in the war. He espoused a pessimistic view of the race's future in the United States and supported the voluntary colonization of blacks in the Caribbean or Central America. Alfred P. Smith, a black journalist who lived in Saddle River, addressed an open letter to President Lincoln during the critical year of 1862, when the military role of black men and the future of slavery in the South were still unresolved issues. To the President of the United States, honored sir, as you are awaiting a reply from the colored of the country to your recent colonization proposition, you will not, I trust, think it strange that a humble person like myself should venture to address you. The simplicity, good sir, with which you assume that colored Americans should be expatriated, colonized in some foreign country is decided rich. Pray tell us, is our right to a home in this country any less than your own, Mr. Lincoln? The Negro, sir, was here in the infancy of the nation. He was here doing his growth, and we are here today. We were with Warren at Bunker Hill. We were with Washington at Morristown and Valley Forge. We were with Lafayette at Yorktown. We were with Perry, Decatur, McDonough in their cruisings, and we were with Jackson at New Orleans, fighting side by side with the white man for nationality, national rights, and national glory. And when the history of the present atrocious insurrection is written, historians will record, whoever was false, the blacks were true. Yours respectfully, A.P. Smith, Saddle River, New Jersey. Several historians have characterized New Jersey as politically reactionary before the Civil War and disloyal during the war. According to this interpretation, New Jersey in the antebellum period fit the mold of either a border slave state or a doe-faced state, that is, a northern state with southern sympathies. To be sure, abolitionism was weak in New Jersey at mid-century. However, opposition to abolitionism did not mean sympathy or support of slavery. The great majority of Jerseyans disliked slavery and distrusted the political power of slave owners. Because Lincoln did not receive the state's entire electoral vote, some observers believe that New Jersey's support for the Union was weak. This fact, however, obscures the Unionist strength reflected in the combined electoral vote for the two northern candidates, Lincoln and Stephen A. Douglas. In 1864, Jerseymen narrowly voted for the Unionist Democratic candidate George B. McClellan, who lived in West Orange for long periods of time during his life, partly because he was regarded as a home favorite by many residents. Once the 15th Amendment became part of the federal constitution, New Jerseyans, with a single isolated exception, did not try to nullify or neutralize black suffrage by force or fraud, nor did the state government attempt disfranchisement. In addition, blacks were not lynched in New Jersey as they were in the border states. Thus, New Jersey bore no resemblance to a border slave state before, during, or after the war. At the end of the hostilities in 1865, women's rights advocates, abolitionists, and radical Republicans began to press for amendments to the United States Constitution to protect freedmen's rights from being undermined in the South. The Democratic-controlled legislature in New Jersey refused to ratify the 13th and 15th Amendments, upon which the hopes of racial equality rested.
It wasn't until the Republican Party won control of the state legislature in 1868 that the 14th Amendment was ratified in New Jersey. The Democrats rescinded the measure when they were restored to power. On March 31, 1870, Thomas Mundy Peterson of Perth Amboy became the first black in the nation to vote under protection of the 15th Amendment. It was during the controversy over the 14th Amendment that women began to organize for their own suffrage. Women's rights advocates were fully aware that the wording of the 14th Amendment being framed in Washington included the word male in relation to voting rights. Like many women's rights activists, Lucy Stone and her husband, Henry Blackwell, chose to accept the wording of the 14th Amendment rather than risk jeopardizing freedmen's rights. Led by Lucy Stone, New Jersey women and men were among the very first to organize at the state level for women's suffrage. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and her friend and colleague, Susan B. Anthony, took a different position from Lucy Stone on the 14th Amendment. They felt betrayed by the radical Republicans and decided to actively oppose the amendment because it did not enfranchise women along with African-American men. In 1868, Elizabeth Cady Stanton moved her residence from New York City to Tenafly, to this charming dwelling on the East Hill. This would be her home base for the next 20 years. Though Stanton was a New Jersey resident, she never became deeply involved in state or local suffrage activities. Her focus was on a woman's suffrage amendment to the federal constitution, and her career often took her away from her comfortable Tenafly home to New York City, around the country, and even to Europe. However, during one election in 1880, she did attempt to vote in Tenafly as a local property owner. November 2nd being election day, the Republican carriage decorated with flags and evergreens came to the door for voters. As I owned the house and paid the taxes, and as none of the white males was home, I suggested that I might go down and do the voting. Ladies, has the Republican Whereupon the gentleman who represented the Republican committee urged me most cordially to do so. The inspectors were thunderstruck. I think they were afraid that I was about to capture the ballot box. One placed his arms round it, with one hand close over the aperture where the ballots were slipped in, and said with mingled surprise and pity, Oh no, madam, men only are allowed to vote. I then explained to him that, in accordance with the Constitution of New Jersey, women had voted in New Jersey. And by a recent amendment to the National Constitution, Congress had declared that all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Two of the inspectors sat down and pulled their hats over their eyes. Whether from shame or ignorance, I do not know. The other held on to the box and said, I know nothing about the Constitution, state or national but I do know that in New Jersey, women have not voted in my day, and I cannot accept your ballot. So, I laid my ballot in his hand, saying that I had the same right to vote that any man present had, and on him must rest the responsibility of denying me my rights of citizenship. Stanton's focus on the federal constitution was well placed. New Jersey suffragists worked unsuccessfully for over 50 years for an amendment to the state constitution that would give them the vote. It was not until 1920 and the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution that New Jersey women regained the franchise. Despite some progress, Efforts by women and African Americans to achieve political and social equality remained unrealized in the 19th century. Women's suffrage and civil rights became part of the reform agenda in the next century. 
Walt Whitman summarized it best when he wrote about the word democracy. It is a great word whose history, I suppose, remains unwritten because that history has yet to be enacted.